Hello everyone, my name is Thijs Geukleide and I've been working on a Belgian sculptor named Jeff Lambeau. Those familiar with him may know him as one of the leading proponents of the fin de siècle Belgian sculpting scene. Lambeau was a bit of an enfant terrible. He had little regard for the conventions and restrictions of high society and, love him or hate him, critics of the era presented him as a kind of picaresque folk hero or man of the people who went about Brussels and Antwerp following his own instincts and hunches. Here we see Lambeau on a portrait made by Eugène Broerman, which alludes to his vivid imagination and restless spirit, which the sources always tell us so much about. Fougueux is one of the words used in French, fiery or spirited. On the right, you can distinguish the outline of the legendary hero of what is arguably his most famous work of art, the Brabo Fountain, placed in 1887 on Antwerp's main town square not far from where Lambeau had grown up. Brabo attests clearly to what Lambeau excelled in, and to one of the main reasons for his celebrity, which was the capture of movement in sculpture. In the 1880s and 1890s, movement seems to have been on Lambeau's mind constantly, and it's not so much the sprint as the wrestling match and the violent struggle to which Lambeau returned again and again during this time. That's what I'll be exploring in this digital talk for the remaining 15 minutes or so. Lambeau was widely hailed as Belgium's premier sculptor of movement. Almost from the beginnings of his career, as one critic put it, he victoriously pursued a solution to the problem of movement in sculpture, sacrificing all other concerns to the matter. As I see it, Lambeau's various wrestling groups didn't just help cement his reputation as a sculptor of movement, the series was a vital way for Lambeau to work through the conceptual and technical challenges of sculpting movement. What did it mean to be a sculptor of movement in fin de siècle Belgium? To take upon oneself the task of illusionistically portraying motion with motionless means? And what exactly can Lambeau's wrestling groups tell us about this? In order to explore these questions, I'll be placing Lambeau alongside a contemporary of his, the photographer Alexandre, born Albert Edouard Drain, who in Brussels at precisely the same time was experimenting and photographing moving human subjects. First though, to set the scene, I would argue that what makes Lambeau's wrestling groups so of their time, if not downright innovatory, is their instantaneity, which is to say, the impression that the sculptor has succeeded in capturing a single instant in the wrestling match in translating the immediacy of the action as he so often witnessed it himself in the fairground Baroque de Lutte. Through their instantaneity, Lambeau's groups are clearly related to the French sculptor Alexandre Charpentier's wrestlers, which was made around the same time. In his case, critics referred explicitly to the second eternalized and the moment in the wrestling match pictured. Of Lambeau's different wrestling groups, this one perhaps possesses the cleanest lines and the most clearly discernible composition, but it too demonstrates that instantaneous feel and that momentary precarious balance, once you really look at it. The pair of wrestlers is shown facing off frontally. Veins pop and muscles bulge as one pushes off with his hand against the chin of the other, while pulling away the arm that grasps his waist. The opponent falls back forming an arch that is so exaggerated that the position seems near impossible, or at least impossible to maintain for longer than an instant in the heat of the fight. The art critic Sander Pierron praised this marvelous curve. Sensing the precarity of the scene, he commented on the as of yet undecided outcome of the battle, as the struck wrestler braces himself so as not to lose balance and to regain a momentum that will perhaps take down his rival. Ambo himself actually evoked this instantaneity even speaking about his groups. I quote, The chance nature of the twists and turns of the fight, and the ferocity with which the amateur tries not to be beaten by the professional he has challenged, sometimes allow us to glimpse, as if in a flash of lightning, absolutely epic plastic synthesis. Those are the kinds of apparitions which, despite their speed, always stay engraved in my mind. End quote. Lambeau's wording hints at a kind of snapshot paradigm evoking the photographer's magnesium flash powder and the instantaneous impression of the scene onto the photographic plate. The wrestlers of the 1880s and 1890s did indeed coincide with the international advent of photographic experiments in recording movement. 
by circa 1880, due to the drastic shortening of the exposure time, there was a dual development of instantaneous photography and of chronophotography, which is, of course, a series of successive instantaneous photographs of a particular movement. Subjects both animal and human were placed before the camera's lens in order to accurately document all that proceeds in the blink of an eye. Wrestling moves were consistently part of such experiments, as were demonstrations of other movements in combat sports, including fencing, boxing, and game fighting. The English photographer Edward Mybridge famously included wrestling in the iconophotographic series which he made in the 1880s in Philadelphia, published in the pioneering work Animal Locomotion. Although these volumes were not purchased by the Paris École de Beaux-Arts until 1901, Mybridge was well known among the French intelligentsia. Already in 1881, he was received in Paris by the physician Etienne Jules Marais, among others. Marais pioneered chronophotography in France in collaboration with Georges Demny. The pair was followed closely by Albert Londe and Paul Richier, who together and with the aid of photography studied human movement at the Salpetriere. Science and art often overlapped quite explicitly. For instance, the preface to Marat and Dominique's Etude de Physiologie Artistique states that they wanted to do artists a service by publishing their studies on human movements. Science and art merge in the search for truth. Though it appears that no such scientific experiments took place in Belgium, the territory was hardly devoid of experimental photographic activity. The photographer Alexandre played a key part in exploring the possibilities offered by new technologies to capture a moving subject. Though born in France, Alexandre grew up in Brussels and in the 1880s established himself as a widely respected photographer. During this time, from 1887 on, he also became closely affiliated with the Association Belge de Photographie, or the Belgian Association of Photography, which championed the photographic cause in Belgium at this time. Its journal, the Bulletin, kept close track of national as well as international developments. As such, it was instrumental in disseminating knowledge in Belgium of the photographic study of movement. Dominique's chronophotographic study of boxing, for instance, was first published in La Nature and subsequently included in the Association's Bulletin. Like many photographers of the era, Alexander dabbled in various genres. Considerably more famous for his photographs taken at the colonial sections of the 1894 Antwerp World Fair and the 1897 Brussels to the Vuren World Fair, he is today hardly remembered for his successes in instantaneous photography. At the time, though, these instantanées were strongly applauded. In fact, fellow photographers went so far as to declare that Alexandre rivaled the greatest instantanist, Marais, Anschutz, Le Gardon, etc. Horses moving had been a constant in the photography of movement from its humble beginnings, so Alexandre's snaps of horses are somewhat expected. More surprising is a photographic series that captures movements of unclad men, made circa 1887. They were shown publicly in so-called séances de projection, presentations of photographs projected with the aid of a magic lantern. One of these was held in the studio shared by Franz Charlet and Paul Dubois, founding members of La Vente, and thus grabbed the attention of the journal L'Art Moderne. The consecutive photographs of a man diving, Le Plongeur, and of the water splashing, Le Plongeon, reportedly caused a stir. L'Art Moderne noted that they were encored at the request of the audience, which was composed of artists and of hommes de lettres. Other reports of such séances de projection mention other photographs in the series. Men climbing, doing headstands, jumping over obstacles. These can likely be found among the glass plates preserved in the Art and History Museum in Brussels. I suspect that the anonymous photograph of an obstacle course of artists was taken in similar circumstances, if not by Alexandre himself, at least by someone in his vicinity. The Association Belge de Photographie noted that each of these photographs of movement, so artistically created by Monsieur Alexandre, is an instantané taken in full movement and not a pose struck and conserved which is a key distinction to make. Alexandre frequented the artistic milieus of Brussels, and Lambeau definitely knew him. In fact, the movement series featured friended members of the artist society Lessor, and Lambeau was close to many of these artists. Alexandre, with the help of Lessor, also staged extravagant tableau vivant style scenes lit by magnesium flash powder. 
These photographs included a scene of two fighters preparing to face off in what is a spontaneous wrestling or boxing match. The magnesium combustion casts the duo in a dramatic clair obscure as a crowd of onlookers goes wild on all sides. Historical evidence then abundantly demonstrates that Lambeau's endeavors would have found fertile soil in contemporary artistic scenes, notably through the affinity of his work with photographic experimentation and due to photography's inculcation of notions of instantaneity and the snapshot. Yet, that photographic experiments were being conducted ought not to blind us to the fact that 1. Such photographs of movement were radically new, and 2. That these did not necessarily find a broad base of support among the artistically minded. Convincing captures of wrestling in full swing remained rare in the fin de siècle. The degree to which photography was a direct model for or even rivaled sculptures of wrestling is questionable. The instantaneous series of wrestling poses produced in 1891 by Marais and Dumeny, for instance, seems stilted and awkward. So do the photographs by Nadar produced in the same year to illustrate a wrestling handbook, even though they were advertised as instantaneous. In comparison, the dazzling virtuosity of Lambeau's groups stands out even more clearly. Plus, even on principle, the artistic application of instantaneous photography was regarded ambivalently suspiciously. In fact, art historian Michael Cole advises us to be cautious in bringing a photographic paradigm to artists who lived not only with a different world of technology, but also with a radically different understanding of the relationship between rest and motion. Today, of course, we are accustomed to high interval photography and shutter speed adjustments, to slow motion, to pausing and rewinding, in film, on laptops, tablets and smartphones. So it is hard, as Ernst Gombrich has noted, to recapture the puzzled curiosity which instantaneous photographs once caused. We don't observe movement as a succession of singular, separate moments, and so to freeze, even at the end of the 19th century, appeared unnatural and painfully finite. Auguste Rodin, in his conversations with Paul Cassel, voiced a widely shared opinion about instantaneous photographs when he noted the odd appearance of a man suddenly stricken with paralysis and petrified in his pose. Because it is frozen, he continued, there is no progressive development of movement as there is in art. In Rodin's view, it is the artist who is truthful, and it is photography which lies, for in reality time does not stop. Indeed, the idea of instantaneity proved especially controversial in sculpture, precisely because of sculpture's traditional associations with permanence. Even Dumeny, for instance, noted that a statue that is excessively frantic, showing an interrupted gesture, frozen in bronze, gives us a sense of undefinable unease. This unease, rooted deeply in artistic theory, helps account for the ambiguity of the critical response to Lambeau's work. Take, for instance, Lambeau's wrestling group entitled Vangé, Avenged, which manages to capture one wrestler throwing his opponent upside down over his shoulders. Said opponent, we realize instinctively represented with the sculpture, is said to be smacked onto the ground, back first. Together, the two are joined in a momentary balance that is extremely volatile. So volatile, in fact, that Lambeau has had to resort to a rather bulky base so as not to endanger the actual, physical balance of the bronze. Time and again, critics saw Lambeau's sculpture as a result of an overriding concern with movement, at the cost of meaning. To the harshest of them, Lambeau's work seemed transitory, incomplete and perishable. Charpentier's Wrestlers, which we saw earlier, was received in similar terms. One critic, for instance, noted the disconcerting effect of the illogical fixation of a fast act in sculpture. In his view, it didn't make sense at all to want to fix for eternity poses which are impossible to hold, in a medium that is by its essence immobile. In order to avoid the frozen effect that was deemed so unbefitting of the medium, divergent lines of thought emphasized the necessity of conveying motion at one remove, or likewise showing the sculpted body in a state of potential, not in motion so much as on the verge of motion. In his conversations with Cassell, Rodin famously explained movement as the transition from one attitude to another. According to Rodin, it is up to the sculptor to allow the viewer to see a part of what was, 
and the part of what is to be. Taking the statue of Marshal Ney by François Rude as an example, Rodin noted, the movement in the statue is only the change from a first attitude, that which the marshal had as he drew his saber, into a second, that which he had as he rushes, arm aloft, upon the enemy. In conclusion, there is a wealth of historical evidence to attest to the fact that Lambeau actively took part in contemporary debate on the nature and representation of human movement. The wrestling groups of the 1880s and 1890s, through their recurrence in Lambeau's oeuvre and their connection to artistic and scientific discursivity of the era, can be singled out as an especially viable way for the artist to work through the conceptual and technical challenges presented by the invocation of motion and action in a medium that is by its very nature solid and immobile. As is mentioned often in contemporary art criticism, Lambeau tackled such challenges not so much in her cerebral manner, by demonstrably engaging with art theoretical and scientific insight, as he did so practically, by creating tirelessly, by revisiting poses, attitudes and subjects ceaselessly, as well as by honing his observation skills, studying the life model. This lack of a clear theoretical foundation, especially combined with Lambeau's lack of esteem for artistic norms and values, is likely a key reason for the somewhat negative slant of much contemporary art criticism, as are repeated by much present-day scholarship. For anyone eager to find out more, I'm discussing the case of Lambeau's wrestlers in much more detail in a paper contribution in the book volume Strained Bodies, Physical Tension in Art and Science, edited by Thomas Moser and Wilma Sheshonk. So be sure to check out the volume when it is published next year. Thank you very much for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to email or you can find me on LinkedIn and Academia. Goodbye.